25 years ago, this is what a busy road in Beijing looked like. This is what it looks like today. This is what a phone looked like. It is hard to notice progress day by day, week to week, or even month to month. But looking back over the last 20 years, we can see that very little has been left untouched by progress. Society, technology, the economy, and geopolitics have all evolved significantly over the last two decades. From the rise of global powers challenging the Western-led status quo, to how we watch movies, to how we date, technology and shifting power dynamics have left its mark on all aspects of our lives. So in this video, I'll talk about the big trends that will shape the coming decades. The rich appear to be getting... has quit his job at Google, warning of the dangers of AI. In the Paris Agreement, several African countries have tried to play their part The number of young people in South Korea is dwindling at a rapid rate. has successfully implanted one of its wireless brain chips in a human... Number one, global GDP. The total gross domestic product of the world is expected to almost double from 113 trillion today to 200 trillion in the next 20 years. This is like adding not one, not two, but three United States to the world economy. $10 trillion companies in the S&P may not be too far off in the future. Over 2 billion people will join the middle class by 2045, mostly in developing nations. Imagine that for a second. Imagine the tsunami of new wealth that will be searching for a home. Keep this point in mind for later. Number two, demographics and growth. Populations are either declining or plateauing in many parts of the world. With the exception of Africa, most countries will have declining and aging populations over the next two decades. This means that countries will compete for immigrants to keep their economies running. And the big winners here will be the West. A lot of wealth that is created in developing countries will move to developed countries as developed countries have the stability, institutions, connectedness, and climate that will be valued by the wealthy. Another reason for capital flows to developed economies is that these economies will experience strong immigration and strong immigration will consequently lead to a healthy amount of inflation. Therefore, these developed economies will be able to maintain positive real interest rates while aging economies that do not have a strong immigration will experience deflation and consequently lower real interest rates. Take this real world example. In Canada, a country with one of the highest rates of immigration, the price of a one-way ticket on the Toronto subway in 2005 was about $1.50. Today, the price is $3.25. That is over a 100% increase. Now compare this to one of the most aged societies, Japan. The Tokyo Metro fare was 170 yen in 1995. In early 2023, the fare was, wait for it, 170 yen. In fact, they announced they would be increasing prices for the first time in 28 years, an increase of 10 yen or less than 10 cents. The economy in an aging society will inevitably face deflation. And to get out of this deflationary trap, the country will have to provide large amounts of stimulus to its economy, and thereby increasing its debt to GDP ratios and making it even more vulnerable to any increases in interest rates and increase the default risk of the economy. And we can already observe capital flight occurring today. Most wealthy Chinese, for example, are looking to pick up and leave China. This phenomenon can also be observed among India's elite and frankly among the elite in any developing country. In fiscal stimulus, it needs to sell more debt, it needs to worsen its debt burden because interest rate cuts and... For China, debt, drought and declining demographics will make it undesirable for both living and investment and it will experience the exodus of both financial and intellectual capital. India will experience a similar phenomenon in the next few decades driven by climate change and possibly sectarian strife. India will develop rapidly, no doubt, but I expect its growth to be wildly uneven, fueling social crises. That being said, I think India should be able to quadruple its economy over the next two decades before it really starts running into trouble. Let's talk about Africa. I know many make the mistake of treating this continent like it's a country, but it is in fact linguistically, culturally, religiously, and economically incredibly diverse. 
However, I too am going to treat this region collectively, given that what a lot of African countries have in common is that they can be found at the bottom of global GDP per capita rankings. Africa has 1.2 billion people, and this figure will likely double by 2050 to 2.5 billion, but it will likely not be a growth driver the way China was for the last 40 years, as it is not a cohesive political and economic entity. Large swaths of the continent may become uninhabitable due to drought, and coupled with the fact that large portions of its population live under autocratic regimes, and that 16 of the continent's countries are experiencing sustained armed conflict, Africa's growth will be very uneven. Now, I need to emphasize that I do not in any way hope that China and India and Africa will fail or show limited success as these countries will be home to over half the world's population. And these billions of people spread across these three massive regions doing well in life and being more prosperous is certainly good for humanity collectively. But I want to be realistic about the challenges that these countries will likely face in the coming decades. Number three energy. Solar and wind prices will continue to decline at astounding rates. In another 10 to 20 years, as electric vehicles and energy storage costs become cheaper, I believe that power grids will become decentralized and distributed. This will be a boon for developing countries where energy bottlenecks can slow down development. This will also put downward pressure on crude prices, and the petroeconomies will likely regress economically back to developing countries as these countries will finally run out of crude revenues. And most of these countries have done very little in the way of building resilient institutions and governance and preparing their population to be economically competitive. OPEC will lose most of his power if it even remains as an organization, and only the most cost-efficient producers will remain. Most oil fields will be stranded assets, too expensive to exploit. Number 4. Automation So there are four types of work as it relates to the kind of work that can be automated. There is physical routine, the type of work that's common or was common in a lot of factories. Physical non-routine, so the type of work that your plumbers or HVAC technicians would do. Cognitive routine, desk jobs that are very repetitive. And cognitive non-routine, so generally speaking these would be desk jobs that involve some thinking and creativity. The easiest to automate are the physical routine tasks and we saw this with robots replacing workers at factories. But not long after, we started to replace the cognitive routine tasks via algorithms. Repetitive tasks like keeping records could easily be automated. One accountant with accounting software can do the job that would require a team of accountants before. But strangely enough, the hardest jobs to automate have been the physical, non-routine tasks. You see, with AI, it looks like that from the remaining two, the cognitive non-routine tasks are on the cusp of automation. Tasks such as design, medical diagnoses, and even some aspects of the law are on the verge of being handed over to AI. Occupations such as plumbers and gardeners and snow shovelers and warehouse workers are much harder to automate. But not for long. The next wave of automation will be humanoid robots that will increase productivity by freeing up labor required for elder care and automate lowly paid but laborious jobs. In the beginning, demand for such robots will come from large companies, such as Amazon. Then, once we get some scale, the prices will come down to the point where the rich will employ these robots as servants and butlers paired with AI. A few years later, mass market robots will be made where a person could rent one for a day to get their lawns mowed and driveways shoveled and roofs redone and help with chores around the house and finally, a few years after that, these robots will become as ubiquitous as dishwashers and washing machines. A humanoid robot will operate in an environment made for humans so it will be able to integrate seamlessly with a human environment and it will be multi-purpose being able to take on a variety of jobs. Now I'm bullish on this as I believe that there is incredible pent-up demand for such technology, especially from large companies looking to automate a lot of their menial labor tasks, as well as demand for elderly care 
particularly within the context of an aging demographic. Any company that can crack this technology probably will end up being one of the next trillion dollar companies. And this technology will be adopted with the same rapidity as that of smartphones. Now, none of the following is investing advice, but given the trends in 20 years time, the West will likely still remain the center of innovation and will create some of the biggest companies that will take advantage of robotics, AI, medicine, and energy. These regions will continue to attract both financial and human capital, and the rest of the world will likely play second fiddle. Furthermore, the collective West are geographically situated such that they will feel the negative impacts of climate change less. But that is not to say that we will not see brilliant pockets of development and success in countries that are currently classified as being developing. And we will see newly industrialized and developed economies joining the club of the most top performing economies today. We might also see a broader trend of populations moving from developed economies to developing economies as many jobs become less location dependent and countries with declining populations create attractive visas and work programs for individuals with these type of jobs. So what do you think? Any big trends that I missed? Any big revolutions on the horizon that you're excited about? Comment down below and if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing for more quality content. Thank you and have a great day. Cheers.